Imagine standing somewhere north of the Arctic Circle, on a frozen lake. The icy cold breeze is blowing your hair back as you rub your hands together to build up some heat. You can see a vast distance in front of you, but all you can hear is that gentle wind playing with the pine trees in the forest behind you. You stare at the miles of snow-covered ice stretching away into the distance, until it encounters the dark, haphazard barrier that is more forest on the opposite shoreline. Raising your eyes to the sky, you focus on the ink-black sky, dotted with billions of stars, more than you could ever imagine even in your dreams. Suddenly, you see a green smudge of light begin to materialize in the northern sky, and slowly manifest itself into waving, shimmering green light, changing into a purplish-red, passing through the dark night sky. What have you just seen? The Northern Lights, nature's beautiful light show. This natural light display in the sky is called an aurora. Though they can occur anywhere, auroras can be seen most often near the North Pole. We call it Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, and near the South Pole we call it Aurora Australis. It's not a surprise to find out the Aurora Borealis is the root of many myths and legends of indigenous people living in countries situated within the auroral oval, from Iceland to as far apart as Greece and China. And the legends of the Aurora Borealis vary just as much. The Northern Lights have inspired the old folk with dramatic tales in Norris mythology, and when you're standing right below the distant sky, watching the bright lights dance and change colors, it's easy to go back in time and understand why the Aurora Borealis is a subject of so many ancient stories. Here are just a few of the many legends and tales about the mysterious lights that fill the dark night sky. Let's start with the Greek, as the word Aurora Borealis is derived from the Greek words Aurora, which means sunrise, and Boreas, which means wind. But if we suppose the ancient Greeks have seen the lights, we have to assume that there must have been some incredibly strong solar activity because sightings so far south are rarely heard of. In Greek mythology, Aurora was the sister of Helios and Selene, the sun and moon respectively. Aurora would race across the early morning sky in her multicolored chariot to alert her siblings to the dawning of a new day. Similarly, the Romans believed in a goddess of dawn, Aurora and associated the Northern Lights with the beginning of a new day. Traveling to Europe The Northern Lights do not normally appear over Southern Europe, and if they do, it would be a result of intense solar activity, which will usually appear in red auroras in the night sky. It would feel pretty terrifying standing under a red-lit night sky. And it's not a shocker that on the rare, rare occasions that they do appear, they cause quite a stir and many words to be exchanged among the populace as to what was the reason behind this otherworldly lights in the sky. For example, the French and the Italians believed the lights were a bad omen for showing the outbreak of anything from war to plague and death. In Scotland and England, there are stories that record the skies are said to have blazed red just a few weeks prior to the French Revolution. Now let's travel across China, Japan, and Australia. You have probably guessed it. Auroras are also rare in China and would have been caused by a significant solar event. So imagine now how the ancient Chinese felt as they watched the lights that sporadically illuminated their night sky. It is assumed that many of the early Chinese legends of dragons were a result of the northern lights. The belief is that the lights were viewed as dragons breathing fire across the firmament. It was a celestial battle between good and evil. The Japanese believed that a child conceived under the northern lights would be blessed with beauty, intellect, and good fortune. The auroras in Southeast Asia have been a fascination to many, and it's not a coincidence that visitors from Japan, Singapore, and Malaysia have increased significantly in recent times. On the other hand, Aboriginal Australians were used to watching the amazing Aurora Australis, the Southern Lights, and viewed them as their gods that were dancing in the night sky. Swimming across the pond, 
to North America, the settlements and tribes that were there were far less concentrated and remote from each other. As a result, each tribe or people evolved their own unique myths surrounding the Aurora Borealis. Let's share a few of the tales that our ancestors would whisper to one another under the colorfully lit sky in North America. To the Cree Indians, the Aurora was a part of their life circle. The spirits of the dead would leave their loved ones and join the people of the past and remain as the lights in the sky. They believed that the lights were a way the spirits would try to communicate with those that they left behind on Earth. The Algonquins believed the Aurora was a fire built by their creator. It made them feel that their creator remembered them and was watching over them. Further north, many Inuit tribes had a quite different view of the lights. They considered the Aurora to be the spirits of the dead playing a ball game using a walrus skull as the ball. Peculiarly, people of the remote Nunavik island told the same story, but apparently it was the other way around for them. The northern lights were walrus spirits playing ball with the skull of some unfortunate human. Sounds like someone messed up the telephone pass on the message game. In Washington state, the so-called Maca Indians thought a tribe of dwarves who used to boil whale blubber were the reason behind the lights. The Mandan peoples of North Dakota had a similar view of fire and cookery, but it wasn't dwarves, it was great warriors that would boil their enemies in huge pots. Delicious, a nice plate of enemy soup with boiled whale blubber. Nothing could get better than that. The North Americans accepted the lights as anything to explain something that they could not understand. They believed anything and everything from ravens to torches that were lit to guide the dead spirits to the next world. The lights were believed to be of dead spirits of many categories, from spirits that died a violent death, spirits of the enemies wanting revenge, and even spirits of dead animals like deer and salmon to other spirits that were dancing in celebration that the sun was gone. Imagine yourself sitting next to the fire under the aurora, huddled in a group of the tribe's people. And it's your turn to share your thoughts of what is happening. What would you say? Finally, coming to northern Scandinavia, Iceland and Greenland, who could enjoy the lights almost year-round, although I'm in doubt whether they enjoyed them or feared them, our Icelandic ancestors thought the lights could relieve the pain of child delivery. But beware, if the mother happens to look at the aurora whilst giving birth, the child could be born cross-eyed. In Greenland, the lights were also linked to giving birth, but the lights were meant to represent the souls of stillborn babies or even babies that were killed at birth. In Norway, the lights were believed to be of the spirits of old mates that would be dancing in the heavens and waving down to those below them. People from Finland had a different view. They saw the lights as a fire fox who ran so quickly across the snow that its tail would brush against the mountains and produce sparks that created the auroras in the night sky. That would be one scene to watch. And another version of the story is that the fire fox tails would sweep the snow into the sky which would catch the moonlight and create the aurora. As a matter of fact, the Finnish word for the northern lights, revantulet, translates literally as firefox. The Sami, who were the indigenous Finno-Ugric people, for them the appearance of the lights were a bad omen, and they were feared and respected in equal measure. They were afraid to even speak of the northern lights, and they believed if you would tease them, say by waving or singing under them, and alert the lights of your presence, the lights would come down and carry you up to the sky. Now that sounds like an amazing adventure to the sky, but another interpretation of this story is that the lights would come down and slice your head off. Even to this day, some of the Sami stay locked up in their homes when the northern lights are bright in the sky, just to be on the safer side. Our Swedish forefathers had a more optimistic view of the northern lights. They believed the lights from their benevolent gods providing warmth and light in the form of a volcano. Others in the country saw them as a reflection of large shoals of herring and boat from the fishermen, and the farming community amongst them took it as a sign of a good harvest to come in the following year. There is much to discover about the Northern Lights from Norse mythology. According to one legend, the chief god Odin, the ruler of Asgard, prepares for Ragnarok, the series of events that would lead to the end of the world 
of the gods and start a new beginning to the world. Legends say that Ragnarok was predestined and would be Odin's greatest battle, and he would need the most fearless warriors by his side. During every battle, he would choose the warriors who would die and join him in Valhalla. The aurora was believed to be the reflections from the shields and armor of the Valkyrie, brave female warriors who chose to die in battle or live to fight another day. Dying in battle was a matter of great honor for the Norse people, and in other legends the aurora was also believed to be a bifrost bridge that would lead those who fell in battle to their final resting place in Valhalla. Of course, when our forefathers stood on a frozen lake somewhere north of the Arctic Circle, they lacked our scientific understanding of what was happening up in the sky. But today we know the exact origin, scientific cause of the lights and the cause behind the colors and movements of nature's spectacular light show. An aurora originates from the regions of the sun's surface that are more active and those regions throw huge bursts of electromagnetic energy called coronal mass injections and send a stream of electronically charged particles more commonly known as solar winds into space. When these solar winds reach us on Earth, we get to witness the spectacular auroral display. Here is what happens. When the electronically charged particles collide with the gases present in our atmosphere, the atoms and molecules in those gases release energy in the form of light until they return to their original condition. Different gases in the atmosphere create different colors. An important factor to consider in this case is the altitude at which the solar wind collides with the gases. Most of the auroras we see are various shades of green, as solar wind collides with oxygen at an altitude between 100 and 200 kilometers. Purple auroras are the result of a collision with nitrogen, which is present at a much lower altitude of about 60 miles. And red auroras are a rare sight to catch. They appear when there are larger solar events and solar wind collides with the high altitude oxygen. Although we have much more knowledge of the northern lights, in our modern day, geophysicists still struggle to predict when an aurora will occur, until a few hours before the actual event. The solar winds that are directed to the Earth can go off course and go into another direction in the vast expanse of space. Other than that, it can simply be the time of the day, as the lights cannot be seen during daylight hours, that might completely obscure the most violent auroral displays. Despite our modern-day understanding of these dancing lights, they still remain a mystery to those who wait under the dark night sky to catch a glimpse of the breathtaking scenes of nature.